Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, Alex Johnson. Ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Funding Council's announcement that the reduction to the higher education budget will prevent expansion of the widening access scheme. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. Signing officer, the letter of guidance I sent to the Scottish Funding Council on the 8th of February this year was very clear that there must be no diminution in efforts to widen access. It is my clear expectation that the number of students from poorer backgrounds accessing university education will increase in the future. I am, of course, aware of the indicative allocations issued by the Scottish Funding Council, and we will be discussing further uh, with the SFC how the allocations enable us uh, to realise our core ambition on access. Alex Johnson. Last month's budget announcement indicated that higher education funding would drop by 36 million, or 3.3 per cent, and the Funding Council have suggested that the fourth tranche of additional undergraduate places will not be allocated to universities next year for the widening access uh, and uh, a, a scheme. The SNP Government have stated categorically that this is a priority of theirs to help deprived young people into higher education, yet this shows that the opposite is actually happening. So, alongside evidence that uh, Scottish young people from deprived areas are half as likely to attend university as their peers in England, is the Cabinet Secretary proud of the Government's record on this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am proud of the fact that under the term of office, uh, under this uh, SNP Scottish Government that we have more uh, people from deprived communities uh, leaving with higher education uh, qualifications. Uh, the proportion um, of young people from deprived communities uh, who will benefit uh, from free higher education by the time that they are 30 it has indeed increased. Uh, from 2007-08 uh, that proportion was uh, 35 per cent. That has now increased to 42 per cent. And it is, of course, a shame that uh, Mr Johnson fails to recognise that for the fifth year in a row that this government continues to uh, invest in over a billion pounds uh, in higher education. And my letter to the Funding Council uh, makes perfectly clear uh, that we will be wanting to go further and faster uh, in our ambitions with widening access and, of course, uh, the recommendations uh, from Dame Ruth Silver and the Widening Access Commission uh, are indeed uh, imminent uh, and that will be informing us all how we move forward and make systemic and lasting change uh, to improve widening access. Question number two, Paul Martin. Sir, can I ask the Scottish Government how many registered sex offenders there are in Scotland and what resources are being put in place to manage them? Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, Police Scotland's National Offender Management Unit is responsible for collating and publishing statistics in respect of registered sex offenders, the details of which can be found on Police Scotland's website. It is for Police Scotland local authorities, the Scottish Prison Service and Health Boards as the responsible authorities to determine the arrangements necessary to meet individual requirements, risks and circumstances. Paul Martin. Well, I do not want to be directed to a website, I wanted the specific figure, but just to, manage, just to advise the Minister of the latest figure, the latest figures provided by the Scottish Government advises that convictions against, by sex offenders against children has trebled over the last three years. Now, President Officer, is time not right now to consider an urgent reform of the way in which we manage uh, registered sex offenders, to consider how we sentence them, and also to consider whether we should put in place proper neighbourhood notification so that our communities can be aware of the most dangerous individuals in our country. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I am aware of the statistics that the member makes reference to, but he will also be aware that there is a significant proportion of those that are associated with historical cases as well, uh, which have been uh, outstanding for some time now being reported. Uh, but of course, it is important we are confident that we have got robust measures in place in order to ensure that we are dealing with the risks which are posed by those who may be registered sex offenders. Uh, the member will be aware that we have very robust measures in place through the MAPA arrangements in Scotland, which were considered by HMICS and the Cairns Spectrum last year, uh, and who published a report setting out what they believe are uh, very significant ways in which we deal with uh, registered sex offenders in Scotland. They have made several recommendations where we can make further improvements in that work, which we are taking forward. 
one of which including the issue around uh, matters relating to accommodations about how we can streamline and reduce the bureaucracy which is associated with some of the aspects of the environmental risk assessment for uh, the housing of registered sex offenders and that work has already been taken uh, forward in the uh, national strategic group uh, who will have the responsibility for the governance and the scrutiny of this process uh, met last month to consider taking this work forward. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On the issue of housing of sex offenders, can I return to a regular concern of mine, which is the National Accommodation Strategy for Sex Offenders, which, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, that these offenders must be returned to the place where they last resided when the offence took place, unless another authority will take them. And in some circumstances, they're going back to where the crime took place, which is horrendous for the people in that area. Can I ask that a note is left for the incoming government to revisit NASO with regard to the rehousing of sex offenders? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the first thing to uh, say to remember is that decisions on where sex offenders live uh, are based on where they can be appropriately monitored and supervised and how any risk that they may pose uh, can be it minimised. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the issues that was picked up by HMICS and the Cairn Inspectorate in their report into the MAPA procedures, uh, which we presently have operating in Scotland, was to look how we can streamline and how we can reduce the bureaucracy around the environmental risk assessment, which is undertaken by the MAPA responsible authorities in considering any issues relating to accommodation. And as I've just set out to uh, Mr Martin, uh, work has already been taken forward in making sure that these recommendations are implemented. But I can assure the member uh, that we continue to keep issues relating to sex offenders uh, under uh, regular uh, uh, monitoring in order to make sure uh, that the very robust measures that we already have in place in Scotland, that where they can be improved on, that we continue to improve on how they operate. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister, I think, is aware of my particular concern around the rehousing of sex offenders within multi-storey flats and other properties where there is communal entrance and exits. I wonder if there has been any consideration given to the dangers that that poses to young people who may also live there, and whether the Government plans to take any action as a result. Cabinet Secretary. As the member will be aware, that I have just made reference to the fact that the, under the MAPA arrangements through the uh, National Accommodation Strategy for Sex Offenders, um, an environmental risk assessment is conducted uh, in order to identify where there are particular risks associated uh, with housing-related issues uh, for uh, sex offenders. And it would then be for the uh, appropriate uh, responsible authorities to take forward any additional measures that they believe is necessary in order to address these issues. So there is an assessment process for identifying risk in these particular areas, and it's then for the responsible authorities in those given areas under the MAPA arrangements to then make sure that they take forward any appropriate action in order to address these matters. Question three, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of planned reductions in higher education funding. Cabinet Secretary, Andrew Constant. Sign off. So next year, the Scottish Government will again invest more than a billion pounds in our higher education sector, at the fifth year in succession where investment has exceeded that figure. We engage closely with university principals in the lead-up uh, to the draft budget and will continue to work with the Scottish Funding Council and the HE sector to secure greater efficiencies, maintain benefits for learners and ensure core outcomes remain the priority. Lewis MacDonald. That is a surprising answer, given that a number of universities face indicative funding cuts of as much as 3.9 per cent in the coming year. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary has done any uh, impact assessment at all on these numbers. She will be aware that Robert Gordon University, for example, is seeking 100 redundancies at present uh, and that there has also been a programme of redundancies at Aberdeen and elsewhere. Will Cab the Cabinet Secretary now undertake an assessment of the impact of these cuts on teaching and research staff and on the quality of teaching and research at our universities? Cabinet Secretary. As indicated to Mr Macdonald in my original answer, we have an ongoing dialogue uh, with the HE sector uh, and indeed the, the Fund Funding Council. 
and of course the, the, the prospect uh, of any job losses, any redundancies at any time uh, in any sector is indeed uh, deeply uh, regrettable. Universities are of course uh, autonomous institutions, something that we've debated far and wide uh, in this uh, chamber uh, and my expectation is that uh, universities will work closely with trade unions to ensure that all staff uh, are fully aware of the reasons uh, behind uh, decisions to minimise the impact uh, on students. And if I could just end, President Officer, uh, with a quote uh, from Professor uh, Downs uh, in a letter to the Deputy First Minister on the 23rd of February where he said, I have now seen SFC's announcement of indicative institutional allocations. This is still a challenging outcome in challenging times, but University Scotland members uh, will recognise uh, it as a significant better outcome for institutions than what was being discussed in January. And I am grateful to you as the Deputy First Minister and Ms Constance for the work done to achieve this. Question number four, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will commit to no downgrading or closure of the children's ward at St John's Hospital in Livingston. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Royal College of Paediatric and Children's Health is a recognised body commissioned by NHS Lothian to undertake a review of its children's services across all of the Lothians. The independent review team should be allowed to complete its work. The opportunity to offer comments to the review team runs until the 18th of March. Neil Findlay. Uh, this week I attended two public meetings on the future of paediatrics across Lothian and I heard parents tell how a 24-7 uh, children's ward service at St John's is absolutely essential to their children's lives. The message from the, these meetings is that no downgrade whatsoever will be accepted. Minister, you can end the speculation and worry for them today. Will you commit to no downgrade of services at the hospital, yes or no? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the reason, of course, for the public meetings is absolutely to hear the views of parents, and that's why those public meetings are ongoing. As I have said, the independent review team uh, should be allowed to get on and complete its work. The opportunity for parents or anyone else to offer comments to the review team runs until the 18th of March, and I would encourage people to take that opportunity. Question number five, Tavish Scott. Presiding officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government when crofters and farmers will receive their less favoured area support scheme payments. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. Less favoured area support scheme Elfas payments will be made by the end of March 2016. Tavis Scott. Can, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply? Um, I suspect after the rally that we've all just been out at, and I want to recognise the fact that he and the Deputy First Minister were both at that rally, he'd better be right. Uh, would he also uh, recognise that the question farmers were asking outside was, can the government guarantee that the full cap payments will be made by the end of June, because that's what they expect to happen? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the member knows, the Scottish Government have just announced £200 million of national money to make sure that people can get their payments in April if their applications are not processed uh, this month. That is a major sign of support for the sector, which I believe has been recognised right across the industry. And indeed, I understood in his own party uh, as well. And we were worked flat out because clearly we want to get all the payments out as quickly as possible. We have until June the 30th. We've got a number of months to go and we're going to make sure all the payments get out. Of course we are. Alex Ferguson. Um. Thank you, presiding officer. I just wondered to what extent will devoting the necessary human resource that will be required to distribute the £200 million advance payment he has announced further delay the application process that still has to be undertaken? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in recognition of the importance of supporting our farmers and crofters at this difficult time, we have employed additional staff and we have announced a scheme which we are confident we are going to implement. Uh, that is the basis on which we announced it, because it is vitally important to underpin our food businesses in this country. Question number six, Duncan McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that its drug strategy, the road to recovery, is working effectively. Minister Paul Beelhouse. Uh, yes, uh, since the publication of the Road to Recovery in 2008 and supported by investment of £254 million on frontline services from the Scottish Government, we have seen substantial improvements across a range of areas. Drug taking in the general adult population is falling, drug taking among young people is the lowest in a decade and there have been significant reductions in the length of time in individuals wait to receive treatment for their drug problem, with 93% now being seen within three weeks of a referral. But we are not complacent, especially given the reported level of drug-related deaths having risen substantially and given the complex health needs of vulnerable older cohort of persons who have an addiction. 
We have also witnessed a huge rise in the number of recovery support groups in communities across Scotland. There are now over 100 such groups meeting regularly, led by people in recovery and making recovery from addiction visible across the country. This is hugely important in demonstrating to those with an addiction that many can and do successfully complete the recovery journey. Duncan McNeill. I thank the Minister for his response and welcome uh, his statement that, that there is no complacency, nor should there be. According to the Information Services Division, there are currently 61,000 problem drug users in Scotland, up from 2009-10. The number of people being prescribed methadone has increased over the piece. Drug possession levels remain unchanged. The number of people admitted to hospital for drug misuse is continuing to rise. Given the economic and social cost of the problem of drug use, which by the Scottish Government's own figures amounts to £3.2 billion a year, um, is there not time uh, to listen to new voices, uh, to listen to new ideas and push for radical change in Scotland's drug policy? Minister. Well, I, I certainly uh, would acknowledge um, not only Duncan McNeill's strong interest in this over many years, and I recognise that, uh, but also the, the fact that he is he's right. It's a substantial problem that we face as a society, and it's one that we take very seriously. Uh, Mr McNeill may be aware we've, we've recently formed a Partnership for Action on Drugs in Scotland, which is charged with trying to find radical solutions to how we tackle what is a pernicious problem in our society. And I certainly agree with him that we have to be prepared to explore uh, uh, new and brave solutions potentially to tackle the problem. Uh, but I'm, I certainly uh, convey to Mr McNeill that I'm willing to do so. Question seven, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to identify and implement improved flood mitigation measures. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. The Scottish Government is determined to reduce the devastating and costly impacts of flooding right across the whole of the country. The flood risk management strategies, which were published by SEPA in December 2015, have been developed with that intention. They coordinate the efforts of all the organisations responsible for tackling flooding and concentrate the work of these organisations in areas where the risk of flooding and benefits investment are the greatest. We now have the most advanced, nationally consistent and locally informed understanding of the causes and consequences of flooding in Scotland we've ever had. Alex Ferguson. Um, well, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. As you'll be aware, during the New Year floods in my constituency, the town of Castle Douglas was partially flooded in an almost unprecedented situation. The source of that flooding was some 30 miles away uh, in the upper reaches of the River Duke, where there is widespread commercial forestry activity and a Scottish Power Hydro scheme. So in looking at improved flood mitigation, what steps is the Government taking to bring interests such as forestry and energy, energy generators into discussions, along with the normal agencies such as SEPA, SNH and others that he has mentioned in his response? Cabinet Secretary. I think Alec Ferguson raises a fair point, and that is why natural flood management, taking into account the impact of forestry, is so central to the new flood risk management strategies that have been published, because certainly that is the way forward uh, in many parts of Scotland, and the various stakeholders that Alec Ferguson referred to have to be part of that process, uh, and the way in which we engage with them is constantly being improved to ensure we get the right flood mitigation measures in place. Question number eight, Graham Day. I thank you to ask the Scottish Government what representations it has made to the UK Government on behalf of the oil and gas sector ahead of the 2016 budget. Minister, Fergus Ewing. Uh, presiding also, the Deputy First Minister wrote to the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the 12th of February, specifying a series of tax measures for inclusion in next week's budget and calling for the consideration of government loan guarantees. These measures are needed to help the industry survive these tough times, protect critical infrastructure, and sustain and incentivise investment. Uh, thank you. One very telling example of the impact of the problems the sector is experiencing is a marked reduction in the recruitment of oil and gas related engineering apprentices for next year. I wonder what can be done to ensure we continue to have a through flow of engineering trainees and as part of that, what the government might do to assist engineering training providers get through what promises to be a difficult couple of years and retain the teaching staff required for when the upturn arrives. Minister. Mr Day is quite right. We, we must help young people uh, by retaining their skills to see the industry through these tough times. There are decades of success ahead for the oil and gas industry once they emerge from uh, these difficulties. That is precisely why an enhanced Adopt an Apprentice scheme was launched last year. 21 apprentices have been helped uh, uh, retain their work precisely because of this scheme, and that uh, is a good thing. Uh, and the First Minister announced a training 
a programme £12 million, which will be open to those seeking training to help move into other employment, either in the oil and gas industry or in the wider energy and other sectors, and will not be dependent on having already secured a job. Thank you. That ends general questions. Before we move to the next site of business, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Mr Lorai Bambas, the Ambassador of Estonia to the United Kingdom. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one. 